Welcome back to Max Garage. If you like what you see here today, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It does help me out. Today I am going to be going over the parts that go to this uh, 79cc Predator small engine and uh, kind of what they are, what they do. This video is really geared towards my intro auto class, but if you're interested in learning about four stroke engines, this might not be a bad one for you to watch anyway. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this, this camera in and we'll go over the parts. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna go over basically this list of things that I'm going to ask about this engine. I will link this to the description. So if you wanna see the actual four stroke identification quiz paperwork, you can see that as well. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is the biggest part of the engine or the main part of the engine, what everything in the engine is built off of. And that would be the block. So this block splits uh, basically in two. Not A lot of these small engines are built in this way. Most of your big engines don't quite come apart like that. But this is the block. So there you go, that is the block assembly. Now one of the questions I ask about a block is what is it made of? So there's really, at this point, two common materials that you'll have a uh, engine block made out of. Either cast iron, which is heavy, strong, hard to repair, but generally doesn't have any issues. Um, or aluminum, which is lighter weight, a little bit more, I guess I'll say fragile, uh, but it is repairable. You can weld cast aluminum. You cannot weld cast iron. This particular one happens to be uh, a little bit of both, actually, but mostly it is cast aluminum. So if we look at this, there is this entire case, all of these fins, these are made out of aluminum. If you're not sure, and I could not find a magnet to do this, but if you take a magnet, a magnet will not stick to aluminum. However, it will stick to cast iron. And again, those are really the only two things that you're gonna see a block made out of. There might be some more exotic things that occasionally get used, but that's gonna be super rare. Now, I said there's a little bit of both. If you look, and you're probably not really gonna be able to see it, but this engine has a steel cylinder liner. So the cylinder, and you can maybe see that there's a difference in color, up to very nearly the top is an iron sleeve. There is a little bit of aluminum at the very top here, but where the piston rings actually ride, while well, the piston and the rings ride, is, a, uh, is an iron sleeve. So if I had a magnet, I could stick it to this part, but not to the rest of it, other than where there's little metal inserts. All right, uh, the piston is the next thing. So out of this table of parts, the piston is this round object over here. And this one is currently disconnected from the connecting rod. Uh, this one was missing parts, so it kind of fell apart. But generally, I won't really have students take this off because it's kind of a pain. Um, you know, it's a little tiny ring that gets lost and it's a very small stamp ring set, although you could also use a pick. Now, one of the questions on this is what type of skirt do we have, a partial or a full skirt? Almost every piston you're going to see is going to be a partial skirt. Now, a partial skirt has an indentation up here where it's cut away, and then it comes down on these edges for stabilization to help control the rock of the piston in the cylinder. So by having longer skirt here, it helps control the rock like so. And as this goes up and down in the cylinder, it has a tendency to rock those direction, not so much this direction. Now, this is a partial skirt. It's got a cutout. What that cutout does is it actually makes room for it to come down closer to the crankshaft um, in a lot of cases. Sometimes they have a partial skirt for weight reasons, but most of the times it does come down closer to the crankshaft. So you can see there, if I turn it sideways, it runs into the crankshaft. Uh, a full skirt piston is just going to be a longer piston, but 
circular all the way around. It won't have this cutout. It will just be a cylinder. So it'll be a nice raw cylinder. It won't have any shape to it. So this is a partial skirt. While we're on this, I'm gonna show you what the ring grooves are. In this piston here, we have three separate ring grooves. So one, two, three. This is very common of a four cycle engine. The top two ring grooves are going to hold what are called compression rings. So these rings will, and I'll just slide one on. So these compression rings sit down into this piston and this ring does not fit well. I'll get into that in a different video. Uh, honestly, I think that we might have problems, but we'll give it a shot. So the top two grooves are compression rings. The bottom groove is used to hold oil ring, which is actually a three ring pack. You have two thin scrapers and then a separating ring as well. So the bottom ring is oil ring, the top two are compression. Now not all engines will necessarily have this number of rings. Some may have more, some may have less, but three is pretty standard in a four stroke. Two compression, one oil. Just before I set this thing down, uh, another thing that can be different about the piston is this piston pin. The piston pin is used to mount the piston to the connecting rod. So the connecting rod, basically this pin fits into it. And really, I have this in, I'm talking about this with the piston, but it's the way it fits the rod that determines if it is a pressed or floating pin. So if this piston pin freely moves within the rod when properly assembled, we call that a floating piston. In order for a floating piston to work, it has to have retainer rings on the piston itself. So like I've got the retainer ring in this side and the, uh, the pin does not go in. It also will not come back out the other side. So if I put the ring in, it won't come out of here because there's a retaining ring. Now you get a retaining ring on both sides and then the pin is in there but floating so it's free to move. So this particular one has a floating wrist pin or piston pin, however you want to call it. Some of your small engines will also have a bearing inside of this. This one doesn't, but some of your snowmobiles, especially two strokes, but uh, some of your snowmobiles, some of your four stroke motorcycles, dirt bikes, things like that. Inside this connecting rod, there will be a bearing in here that this piston or that this uh, wrist pin floats in or rotates easily within. If this were a press fit, what happens is to install the piston on the rod, they heat this end of the rod, which causes it to expand, slide the piston through, or slide the pin through, and then as this cools, which you quench it with oil typically to get it to cool off quickly, um, it tightens up and locks onto the piston pin. So as it does that, the piston pin is now stuck in the rod, so that would be a pressed fit. In order to remove something that's pressed in like that, you have to get a fixture and you have to press the rod and piston back apart. And really you're pressing that piece that I just dropped on the floor, the wrist pin. That part locks into the rod in a press fit application. If you have one that maybe doesn't quite get heated and cooled right, sometimes they will walk side to side and wreck engines. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, most of your small engines have a floating pin, and most of your high performance engines will have a floating pin. Uh, your production, produ your production car engines tend to be more likely to be a press fit. Uh, that. Stuff does change. Some of your newer engines may be going towards a floating pin as well. The nice thing about a floating pin is that you can assemble and disassemble it with very little special tools. Where a press pin, you have to have one, a rod heater, or I guess you can do it with an oxyacetylene torch, but uh, it is definitely a skilled process to do that. Uh, the floating is easier to deal with from a repair standpoint.
All right, since I was already playing with this, we'll talk about the connecting rod. So in this little Predator engine, this connecting rod is made out of the same material as the block, which is aluminum. Uh, aluminum rods are relatively common in these small engines. They are not common in a production car engine. Uh, production car engines have either what is called a powdered metal connecting rod or sometimes a forged metal connecting rod. And by metal, I mean steel or iron, uh, some type of alloy within that. Aluminum is not real common. When you get into some super high performance stuff, you'll start to get aluminum rods again. Generally speaking, those are for very short use, like drag racing engines that get rebuilt all the time, um, things like that. So aluminum, aluminum is kind of strange in the fact that it's used in the cheap, weak engines, and then it's also used again when we get into some really high performance stuff. But this one is aluminum. It's got this weird little thing off the side that I'll talk about later. And uh, yeah, that's it. So in the en with an engine connecting rod, you have basically two ends. You have the small end, which is a small hole, and the big end, which it has the, the big hole. The small end hooks onto the piston, which I, we just saw a second ago. The big end hooks onto the connecting rod journal on the crankshaft, which we'll get to here in a minute. Uh, this is one of those parts that torquing these fasteners to the correct specification is absolutely critical. And if you change the style of fastener, the connecting rod needs to be remachined to accept it in a proper way. Let's say you have a big block Chevy and you're going to put ARP studs in here. When you tighten them down, these, uh, these holes, if you mic them loose, are actually not perfectly round. Well, I shouldn't say that. When you mic them loose, these holes may or may not be perfectly round, and we don't really care about that. When we torque these fasteners, this hole needs to be perfectly round. So when you change the fastener you're using, it changes the way it flexes this rod, and you don't really think about metal as something that moves most of the time, but it does quite a bit. So when you change the type of fastener, you also change the requirement on your machining. So if you change fasteners, remachine the rod. All right, let's move on to the crankshaft. When we look at this crankshaft, this particular one really has three journal surfaces. So this is a single cylinder engine and it has three journal surfaces. We've got these two here, which go through, well, in this case, they go through a bearing. So they fit into a roller bearing. Not all engines will have roller bearings on the crankshaft. In fact, very few of them do uh, in the grand scheme. Kind of a lot of these small engines do, but once you get bigger than, bigger than a small engine, like an automotive engine, they don't have roller bearings anymore. Why that is, I guess I don't really know, but they don't. So anyway, um, so we call these journal surfaces the main bearing journal surfaces and the rod bearing journal surfaces. Now the main bearing, if you look at them, are all in a line. So if we had a multiple cylinder engine, we would have journals off, offset every so often, but there would be several bearings that are in a straight line that bolt into the block. Those are called your mains. The mains are what the crankshaft spins around on. The other journal you'll have on a crankshaft is your rod journal. So this one is the rod journal here. If you look at it, it is offset from the center. So if we take our center line through here, say that's the center line of the crank, or actually should be pretty close. Uh, the center line of this journal is half of the stroke. We call that the throw of the crankshaft. So the throw of the crankshaft is the center line. So I'll use this push rod to kind of indicate the center line of the uh, rod journal. And this one here kind of indicates the center line of the crankshaft, the main journals. So if we measure this from here to here, and we uh, that is considered the crankshaft throw. So how far off center the crankshaft goes. 
in order to get the stroke of the engine, you double that because you have the throw here, you also have the throw here. So as this spins, you get double the throw, which turns out to be the stroke of the engine. These things over here are called the crankshaft counterweights. Now, counterweights on a single cylinder engine are really easy to tell what they do. And uh, it's kind of right in the name. So a counterweight offsets the weight of everything on the other side. So to have this engine be perfectly balanced, we would take our center line again. And we have need to have the same amount of weight down here as we do up here. So these things also have to allow the connecting rod to pass through them. All right. So as this connecting rod or as this thing spins, we want it to be balanced and not shake. So along with the weight of the rest of the crankshaft here, it also has to offset the weight of the piston, rod, and pin. Okay, the, rod, the rings are kind of like a, a floating deal that ne doesn't necessarily come into play for balancing, but that's, that's the job of these things here, which are called the crankshaft counterweights. So on this end of the crankshaft, this is the flywheel end in this particular case, there's a key here and that lines everything up so that it comes on as, and is in the proper location with the crankshaft itself. Now, here is one that I was actually kind of surprised this, this is like this. This is the camshaft to, the, to this engine. Now the camshaft's job is to is to control the opening and closing of the valves in the engine. A lot of these smaller engines seem to have gone to a plastic camshaft. So the gear and the lobes were actually made out of plastic. This one is made out of steel or iron. Uh, it's kind of a little rough casting there that should be smooth and it's not, but you know, it is, it is what it is. It's a, it's a cheap little engine and I'm surprised it's made out of, out of steel and not plastic. So yeah, this is our camshaft. Now, if we look at these two lobes and you can probably see it pretty good there, they're kind of egg shaped and they're egg shaped in different spots. That's because as they turn, they control the opening and closing of the valve. So I'm going to grab my block here and I'm going to set this in. So if you look, you can see that the outer lobe lines up with a hole in the block and the inner lobe lines up with a hole in the block. Now into those holes in the block, we have these things called lifters. Now these are the lifters for the small engine. The one for an automotive engine look quite a bit different, but these lifters slide into those holes. So we'll slide them in there right now. Slide our camshaft in. Okay, and I'm not sure if you're really gonna be able to see this or not, but that's about the best angle I'm gonna get. As this camshaft rotates, it pushes on the lobe and causes it to open. And then as it goes past, the lobe can then close back down to the base circle. That controls the valve movement. So if we want to figure out which lobe is which, all we have to do is kind of line things up. So our cylinder head sits on here like so. All right, so if we line things up, we got a push rod that goes, we've got a push rod here that goes up through the head and then hooks into the rocker arm and the rocker arm works on this valve. Now, if we look at the valve, which we're going to get to in a little bit more in a, in a minute, if we look at the valve action on this head, the exhaust valve is over here and the intake is over here. So that means that in this particular case, the The camshaft, 
The, the lobe next to the gear on the camshaft operates this side. This lobe here operates, okay. So this lobe here operates this side. This lobe here operates this side. The exhaust valve is over here. The intake valve is over here. Therefore, this is the intake lobe and this is the exhaust lobe on this camshaft. Now the camshaft and the crankshaft in this case mesh together with gears. A lot of our automotive applications use belts or chains. Some of the heavy duty ones would also use gears, but this uses a direct contact gear setup. Now if we look at these gears, there's a pretty significant difference in size. And that is because the camshaft will travel at half the speed of the crankshaft. So if the crankshaft is spinning 1000 RPM, so if this is spinning 1000 RPM, then this camshaft will be spinning 500 RPM or half. Now in order for it to get to the camshaft running at half speed, there has to be double the amount of teeth. And I did not count these, so don't take this as I counted them. But just a, just a generalized example, if we have 20 teeth on the crankshaft, we'll have 40 teeth on the camshaft. And that's so we get our proper gear reduction. All right, now let's take a look at the valves. So I don't think this engine's ever been run. In fact, you can see down inside this, what is an exhaust port is very clean. Um, but we're going to go ahead and take this apart. Now this engine is very easy to take valves out of. You can maybe see a little bit of a cutout there. All I'm going to do is take my finger, press up on this valve, push down and slide over with the spring and the spring is now out. Okay. Now sometimes it's pretty easy to tell which one is the exhaust and which one is the intake because the exhaust will typically be rather carbon fouled up although new air engines are not as bad, and the intake will generally be very clean. And then again, some of your new car engines, the intake valve tends to get very carboned up as well as the exhaust. So anyway, I've taken that valve spring out. The valve now just slides out of this hole. So there's another way that you can kind of tell which one is which just by looking at them, and that is size. So if we look at the size relationship, the, if there is a difference, which most engines, there will be a difference. If there is a difference, the intake valve is larger. Unless we get into a weird situation where we have like a three valve head and two of them are intake, then it might be two smaller intake and one big exhaust. But if, there, if we're talking a two valve engine or an even number of valves, two valve, four valve, whatever, the bigger valves are going to be intake, the smaller valves are gonna be exhaust, and that's because it's harder to get air into an engine than it is to push it back out. So we can tell by what hooks up to that port. You know, this side has a muffler, this side has a carburetor, uh, the size of the valve, some other conditions inside the head, like if it's dirty inside one port and clean in the other, the dirty port is probably the exhaust. Uh, yeah, that's about it there. Okay, so when we're looking at the valve itself, there's actually several different parts here. So the valve stem is this long cylindrical piece. Now, it's going to have to have a way for it to stay. Uh, there's going to have to be a way for the spring to get locked into it to return it. So that area, this is called a spring retainer. And then the area that it goes on to, that little smaller piece right in there, that is called the lock groove. So lock groove, retainer, valve stem. The valve face is this machined area right here where the valve actually seals when it closes. So the valve face and this um, seals against this part of the head right here and that part of the head right there is actually called the valve seat. So the valve face and the valve seat are the parts that get machined when we're doing a valve job in order for these two to create a good tight seal when they're closed together. Now I already kind of mentioned the valve spring, but 
I'm gonna reinstall it here. Again, this, this engine is really easy to put springs on and off of, so I'll hold it in place, put it back together, and the valve spring has uh, basically two jobs. One is when the engine does not want the valve opened, it keeps the valve closed. The other thing that it does is after the valve has been opened by the rest of the valve train, it, it returns the valve. So I can push this thing open, you see it open, the spring is what's closing it. Okay, so the valve spring closes the valve and then keeps it closed while it's supposed to be closed. That's it, pretty simple job. And the last part I'm gonna talk about here is this little piece on the connecting rod. And in this small engine, what that is, is the oiling system. So the crankshaft sits, we got it backwards, but whatever. All right, so the crankshaft sits down in here and you can see this part as it rotates, that is where the connecting rod would be bolted onto. So as this connecting rod goes around on the crankshaft, it basically does one of these numbers. All right. Now, in these small engines, they don't typically have an oil pump. So what it does is we fill this up with oil, and the oil gets filled up to about here. As this engine runs around and the connecting rod spins, it actually takes this this piece goes down into the oil and just throws oil around everywhere inside the engine. On a bigger automotive or even some of your higher end small engines, but uh, on pretty much anything that's not a real small four stroke engine, they have an oil pump that is driven by either a crankshaft or a distributor or something like that that pumps the oil through to feed oil to everything. On these small engines, we just have a splash lubricant that this literally dips in and just throws it around. Uh, some of these have a little bit more engineering where it dips in and it actually funnels oil up into the connecting rod. This one has a hole. So as the oil is being flung around, some of it goes back into that hole and makes it into this rod journal. It also has some kind of wider spots here for oil to get into, but that's it. This oiling system just throws oil around and gets it into the places that it needs to. That's all that I would cover on this intro tech, uh, visual ID, hands-on type exam. So obviously there's a lot more to go into on all of these parts but that is your general stuff that is within a four cycle engine. So thanks for watching, hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you later.